Auto insurance can all seem the same until it comes time to use it. So don't get stuck paying more for less coverage. Switch to USA Auto Insurance and you could start saving money in no time. Get a quote today. Restrictions apply. Ever wonder what psychologists talk about over coffee? I'm Debbie Sorensen, a clinical psychologist in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, where I specialize in rehab and health psychology and acceptance and commitment therapy. And I'm Diana Hill, a clinical psychologist in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California, where I specialize in mindfulness and values-based approaches to therapy. In this podcast, we bring psychology research into practice by discussing topics from psychology with experts in the field and with each other. You'll get a glimpse into the books we read, the research we think is interesting, and the ideas from psychology that we use to thrive in our own lives. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Happy New Year, Diana. Happy New Year, Debbie. It's really good to see that you made it back home for the holidays, and Happy New Year to all of our listeners. We have a really wonderful episode ahead for you today um, that's quite timely with with the the brand new year. Um, We have an interview with Dr. Jason Lillis, who is a really leading researcher on using acceptance and commitment therapy for weight loss. So we think this is really timely with the new year. I know a lot of people start thinking about weight loss around this time of year. Um, And Dr. Lillis has done some really great research um, using sort of a different approach to weight loss that uses a lot of psychological strategies, a lot of um, sort of ideas about weight loss that will sort of turn on its head, what people normally think about when they think about weight loss. And you might find it really helpful and interesting. Yes. And we also have a gift for you in the new year based on Dr. Lillis's episode. So in the episode, he mentions a couple of his favorite experiential exercises that he uses in his book, as well as with clients. And one of the exercises he mentions is called body gratitude or body self-compassion. And so what we decided to do was to record a meditation of body gratitude for you. And we will be posting that on our website, offtheclockpsych.com, so that you can listen to it and maybe practice some body gratitude in the new year. That's a, a little gift from us to you. Yeah, we. I hope you find it helpful and I'm, I'm looking forward to practicing it myself. <laughs> in the new year. Yeah. And I think we have also an idea for just a little something that that people can maybe do just as a new year's practice if they're if they're so inclined. Yes. So I know that a lot of people like to do a year end review or, or new year's resolutions. And one of the year end reviews that we thought would be appropriate would be one that actually focuses more on meaning in the year for you. And one of the ways that we can access a sense of meaning is actually looking at our challenges. So if you wanted to do a little journaling exercise in the new year, you could start by free writing a bit about the challenges that you've faced you've faced in the last year and then after free writing a bit about those challenges maybe choosing the top 3 challenges for you and then from those top 3 challenges looking at what are the lessons and meaning and values that surface for you out of those challenges it can be pretty powerful to look at how the struggles that you faced more often than not produce the biggest growth And we would uh, be interested in seeing how that works for you and and doing a little bit of a different reflection and carrying those strengths into the new year. Yeah, we were just talking about how this is a theme that's come up again and again on this podcast recently, which is about how the challenges and difficulty in life can actually sometimes be really meaningful. And so hoping to reflect back on the previous year in a way that can help with some growth and, and building meaning in 2018. Wonderful. So let's launch into Dr. Jason Lillis. Jason Lillis is an assistant professor at the Weight Control and Diabetes Research Center at Brown Medical School and the Miriam Hospital. He is a leading ACT researcher who is currently running NIH grants aimed at developing and testing ACT methods for health behavior change with a specific focus on weight control and physical activity. He's the author of three books, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, The Diet Trap, and Mindfulness and Acceptance for Treating Eating Disorders and Weight Concerns, and is an editor of the Journal of Contextual Behavioral Science. 
And you can find links to his books at our website, offtheclock.com. So welcome, Dr. Lillis. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So this episode, we're really excited to have you. I've been actually using your work uh, for a while in my clinical practice, and in particular, The Diet Trap, and I feel really honored to have you on. Mm. And it's in particular, this episode being a New Year's episode where a lot of Americans are going to be resolving to change some habits, eat better, maybe they want to exercise more, or even lose weight. And Debbie and I thought it would be a good idea to bring on an expert in weight loss and obesity, but in particular, someone that offers a fresh and different perspective on what has been really a lifelong struggle for a lot of people. So we're excited to hear the ACT perspective on weight loss. And But before we do that, because you're an ACT researcher, I know I can ask you this question, which is <laughs> the sort of personal meaning for you behind doing some of this work. Yeah, well, it, it's uh, interesting you start there. Uh, definitely didn't go this way for career advancement. In fact, um, I, my advisor, uh, Steve Hayes, when I was picking a dissertation topic, he actually really emphasized to me to pick something to research that I really cared about because he said research is hard and takes a long time and you run into obstacles. And if you don't care about what you're doing, you're not really going to stick with it. And he was right about that. But he also warned me that obesity was a difficult area to work in. <laughs> he mm -hmm. said it's an area where many researchers' careers went to die because it's so hard to get change, uh, long-term change in the area of uh, changing people's eating habits and exercise habits. And he was right about that as well. But, uh, you know, so far I'm sticking with it here. But the personal meaning piece for me is just that uh, my entire family is um, – either overweight or obese, everyone in my immediate and extended family. I've been overweight, borderline obese uh, in my life, and it's something that I basically struggle with all the time. So I, it's sort of part of me, um, mm. that sort of food, uh, food see seeking pleasure through food, seeking comfort through food. And it's something that I, if I don't continually work at, um, I w would also, you know, um, be probably obese for the rest of my life as well. Um, so that has very personal meaning to me just because it's it's my own struggle. It's a struggle of everybody in my family. And um, so it's definitely not an accident that I, I ended up swimming in these waters, so to speak, from a, a, a research psychologist perspective. And so that's the motivation and to keep you going in what you also described as one of the most difficult areas to research and uh, get change in as well with people. I was actually curious about, it seems like more and more focus has been on pharmacological and surgical interventions for weight loss. Is there any hope for behavioral methods? It, it, seem, it seems like everything is like obesity society, society every, all the research, all the money is just sort of moved out of behavioral approaches and into medical intervention. Well, it's interesting that that is, I think, partially true and partially not true. I mean, for one, they'll always be looking for pharmacological solutions for everything. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, the pharmacological solutions outside of, you know, things like statins, which are amazing, have really come up short. And that's definitely true in the obesity area. Um, there, there just isn't – they may come up with something. I may be surprised, but I, you know – a pill that somehow is going to control your weight is is really probably a pipe dream. It's not going to stop <laughs> big farmer from trying to find it. Um, but if they find something helpful, it'll probably be in conjunction with people making behavioral changes on top of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll need good behavioral interventions for that. And that's true on the surgical side, too. Surgery has definitely better outcomes than behavioral does for long term. There's no question at this point. Um, However, I think it is given, it's maybe overestimated how well it does because weight regain still continues to be a problem even among surgery patients. So uh, if you do the surgery and you don't make meaningful behavioral changes, there's a really good chance you're going to be back, maybe not exactly where you started, but not where you want to be after that's all said and done. And that's because you can, you know, eat through some of these biological changes they make in you. Um, it's it's not a magic bullet. So 
also surgeons so if if you go to the surgeons and ask them <laughs> what they think about behavioral they'll say yes please we need it please help me please help my patients they need behavioral stuff um, and they're promoting surgery so they but they understand the need for also making behavioral changes that will help their patients do well long term so i think you know you'll continue to see a rise in surgical procedures uh, because they do have a dramatic effect. And as that happens, we need to be better with our behavioral interventions to help support people in that process. But we also just need to get a good behavioral treatment so that everybody doesn't have to have surgery too. Um, particularly folks who are, you know, less obese or just overweight who, who don't need to, for example, lose weight for several years just to get back to kind of a healthy range. So I think behavioral will continue to be the frontline treatment through things like Weight Watchers, you know, stuff like that. Like Weight Watchers has a real scientific wing where they're trying to incorporate the latest behavioral strategies mm -hmm. so that you'll continue to see behavioral work be disseminated through commercial products. And then you'll continue to see it be incorporated into surgical interventions to try to improve long-term interventions. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you are approaching a behavioral intervention for weight loss and maybe how it's different than uh, what most people are seeing? Uh, because you actually, in your book, The uh, Diet Trap, you don't mention any weight st reduction strategies until the end of the book. And you actually argue that our weight loss agenda or an agenda for weight loss is part of the problem. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the the weight loss strategies at the end of the book. So there was when we were writing that book, there was debate of whether they should be in there at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's that, and in fact, a lot of people who've read the book have said it's really kind of jarring to get to that chapter mm -hmm. and have that information in there. And the publisher actually wanted it first, and we said no way. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's not what we're doing here. Ultimately, we decided that information is good, and you know. Uh, for people who have not been exposed to those kind of concepts before, they are useful when taken from a certain context. And so we did put them in there. Um, but yeah, I think, I think you could kind of boil down the difference in our approach uh, versus a traditional approach is the traditional approach is very narrow. It's trying to narrowly focus you on, you know, two, three things that you're going to do over and over and over again. Those things are basically to step on a scale, to write down everything you eat, all the calories um, to, and to have goals that you meet each week. And it doesn't really care how you get to that. It just matters that you, you know, you do those things. And it, it actually, that really works well in the short term. Like for people about six to nine months of that is about what they can stand. It seems like, <laughs> but, uh, people lose weight doing that. There's no question. The problem is it just kind of falls apart over time and then people gain weight back and stuff. So it's a very narrow, traditional is a very narrow approach, like boil it down to these behaviors, you're gonna track them, you're gonna do this. Our approach is kind of takes the opposite. We go very broad and we wanna say, why are you even doing this? Why, why does this, why even do this at all? First of all, it's very hard to do. Um, so is this meaningful to you in some way? And we try to find what is meaningful, deeply personally meaningful to each person um, in, in terms like what does being healthy empower in their life and how does it make them, you know, live a life that's more um, satisfying and meaningful. So we go very broad and say, how does like being healthy relate to uh, relationships and work performance and all these these other things you care about? And we try to hook um, the personal meaning onto the behaviors so that they're not just following some script of now I eat toast and egg whites and then I've met my goal yay um, it's it's more about you know making the toast and egg whites is about you know I'm going to have energy for the grandkids and my work performance is going to be improved um, help me provide better for my family and so on so we're trying to tie it to things that are going to have uh, motivation that will sustain them over time because this is something it's really a life change you 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 don't get done with this you know you're you're it's it's a lifestyle change that you have to implement, uh, you know, to varying degrees for the rest of your life. So um, if it's not personally important and meaningful to you, you probably are not going to stick with it past the short term. Right. 
So those the values being much more solid and stable than something like a, a short-term weight loss, which can be quite um, fragile because you can move away from the the new habits or you know fall off the wagon or all of that. And if your if your motivation is just based on weight loss, it's not going to be necessarily sustained. But what happens once you lose the weight? Right, the motivation and- goes away. Yeah. 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 Or when you just realize that you have a long way to go and it's very hard to do. That's another thing. You know, people get a third or halfway to their goal and it's just, it's worn them down because Mm -hmm. it is, you know, to, it's, it's very difficult to keep going unless you have, you know, real reason to, this is like connected to something that's very, very important to you. And I also left out another piece that you mentioned, which I should, uh, bring up because I think it's important, which is, you know, a lot of people go into the task of weight management um, for what we tend to call like avoidance reasons. You know, they, they don't like how they feel. They don't like the thoughts they have about themselves or how other people experience them in the world. And they think that they'll lose the weight and then everything will be better. And Again, that seems to be able to sustain people's behavior in the short term, but it it doesn't seem to be doing that in the long term because uh, for lots of reasons. One, it's very hard to reach that magical weight. Two, you might meet the magical weight and find your thoughts haven't changed at all. Your Mm -hmm. feelings haven't changed much at all. So now you're like, well, why did I even do this? (laughs) I was supposed to feel better and everyone was supposed to love me. Um, So these sort of more avoidant forms of motivation where it's about I really need to feel differently about myself. I need to think differently. I need other people to think and feel differently about me. Um, that can sometimes be a trap, and that's something that um, um, you know people can run into. Whether they, either they can't sustain for long enough because it's not a not a real good source of motivation, or they find that their thoughts, feelings aren't changing as much as they want to, and they think, well, why am I doing this then? Mm-hmm. So. That's what you describe lots of a lot of times in the books as, as the fix me trap and how we right. can get back caught into the fix me trap even when things are going well it becomes oh I'm doing a good job at fixing myself but that in itself is a, is a trap as well mm-hmm. sure yeah because if you're if you're something to be fixed um, first of all that's not a real great place to start um, but also that's going to be very hard to do because usually that means again just thinking good thoughts and having good feelings all the time which is not it's not the human experience. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm sure our listeners of your podcast will be uh, will be well, well versed in. You know, that's just not humans. We 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 do the whole range: some good, some bad, some in between. So um, yeah. So if you're if the goal is to sort of make all the bad stuff go away, weight loss it's not going to do that for you long term. And you talk a lot about uh, sort of the different types of thoughts that people get hooked by. In, in weight in attempting to lose weight and two in particular categories you talk about are self-sabotaging thoughts and self-evaluating thoughts can you speak a little bit to those and how the different hooks that are unhelpful yeah well I think it's very you know if you come part of an act approach in general and certainly our act approach to weight is you know to help people kind of give people a different experience of their thoughts um, cause you know, typically we, we experience them very literally. We're very close up on them. Um, we almost don't even realize we're having thoughts. It's just kind of feels like a part of who we are. And when you're coming from that perspective, you know, um, folks who are overweight or obese, not everybody, but, uh, but many, if not most, I'd say have a history of being stigmatized for their body shape. Mm-hmm. And there's you know, kind of a persistent cultural message that for a couple things. One, being of a larger body shape is the least desirable characteristic you could have. And there's been a lot of very disturbing research on that <laughs> where it's, you know, consistently a person with a larger body shape is always seen as less desirable as even, you know, folks who have like amputees and and um, you know, uh, severe disabilities and severe mental health problems and things like that. So as a society, we've said that's the worst thing you could be, which, you know, has a persistent effect on someone um, 
over time when you're living in a society that that feels that way. And also as a society, we've kind of decided to send the message that obesity is um, 100 percent within personal control. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of where the self-sabotaging thoughts come from are those two sources. So things like I'm weak, I have no willpower, I'll always be this way. Um, Self-evaluative thoughts like uh, I'm disgusting, nobody loves me, and so on. These are difficult thoughts to experience from a literal perspective. So if you're just experiencing the normal stream of thoughts like a, like a, like a normal person would, um, that is difficult to have those thoughts and, and continue to do things that are hard for you because one of the things we know is one of the best short-term ways to kind of change how you feel right now uh, is to eat comfort foods. Um, it, it, it works. It works really well. It doesn't work for that long, <laughs> but, it, but it works in the moment. And so having a constant stream of these kind of self-sabotaging or self-evaluative thoughts um, can often be temporarily put at bay by just doing something comfortable. Unfortunately, those tend to be the exact kinds of things that kind of keep us in unhealthy behavioral patterns. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a kind of a vicious cycle that way. And it seems like another part of the cycle is this belief that disparaging ourselves or disparaging other people will actually motivate them to eat, to eat I, differently. And it's the exact opposite. So saying, saying I'm disgusting would motivate me not to eat less, but actually to eat more. And that's, it's a little bit of a paradox there. Uh, and how we, how we also approach others, maybe if we have family members or uh, friends that are struggling with weight issues, motivating them by criticizing them is, is not effective either. Yeah, that, yeah. that's 100% accurate. Yeah, the, the research they've done on that so far has been very consistent and it if absolutely seems like it it would fuels unhealthy eating mm -hmm. it does not prevent it now you always have anecdotal stories you know in people in your life or media who just said there's the guy who said i just looked myself in the mirror and i just thought it was so disgusting and you know i went ahead and made these changes and now i've you know lost 100 pounds or something and and that may even be true, but it, the truth is for the vast majority of people, it tends to be a demotivating process. And, um, you know, we have an exercise in the book uh, where we, we talk about the mind as the world's worst motivational speaker because our minds in to some degree have internalized, you know, a lot of uh, kind of societal norms. And it's a societal norm to think that, you know, we should be motivated by uh, criticism um, when it comes to this area. And so your mind will be just as harsh, if not more harsh, than any other person out there about how you look. Actually, for sure will be more harsh about how you look and your own behavior and your own health habits. And you'll catch it berating you over and over again. And we we talk about this as our mind being a terrible motivational speaker because – you can almost see the the you know the the aspect of that where it, it's sort of is trying to help us. Mm -hmm. It thinks that it's going to motivate us to be healthy and to get our act together when in fact is really just motivating us to go stop and get some cookies on the way home. Um, so it's kind of misguided in that respect. So we have people try to relate to their mind that way as like, you know, your mind's a little misguided here. It thinks that if it says these things to you, it's going to help you out. So we have people write their, their <laughs> worst motivational speech, and then we have them say it in some kind of um, non-believable or goofy voice just to give them a kind of different experience of the whole um, kind of greatest hits criticism album they have playing in their head just to give them some space from it, some distance from it. Um, uh, maybe even laugh about it a little bit. Um, so, but yeah, it's um, it, it's very difficult to get out of that cycle of having these difficult thoughts and kind of doing something to try to maybe feel better in the moment because you don't feel good anymore. Mm -hmm. So the there's the unhelpful thoughts as being a hook that often triggers us to 
move in, move away from our values in terms of, you know, eating behavior, exercise behavior. And then another uh, challenge for people is cravings. And, Mm -hmm. and that's also something that happens underneath our skin that uh, we don't have a whole lot of control over, but that can drive us away from our values. How do you approach cravings in, in your books? So we'll also a little bit different than maybe traditional approaches. Yeah. It, well, I'm going to put a caveat out there first, which is I'm I'm a hundred percent sure that we do not know yet the best way to approach this issue. Okay. <laughs> and there's there's ongoing research that will hopefully help us figure this out. Mm-hmm. But I'll give you my take, you know, based on my clinical experience and the the little that I have done from research perspective on this so far. Uh, it's a it's a very complicated issue though, one we're still working on. But traditional approaches are based on the idea of like total avoidance of desired foods. So it's like if your cookies are your your demon, then you just don't have them. You don't have them in the house. You never put them in your mouth, and that's it. That's how you deal with it. Um, the problem is, you know, we live in <laughs> those of us, you know, fortunate not to have um, you know issues with basic needs at least are then live in this world here at least in this country where there's food abundance and we're just bombarded by food so if you just think about your drive to work or you know anywhere you go how many places you pass that sell tempting food that is either the thing you like or very much like the thing you like and how inexpensive that is and how easy it is to grab and most of the time you don't even have to get out of your car people will just hand it to you through a window so um it's very hard to then say you're just will never expose yourself to this, and that's how you'll get past this this craving. Uh, I just think it's extremely unrealistic, and I, I personally think it's one of the main reasons that behavioral treatments fail in the long term, because they're ignoring this incredible environmental mm-hmm. uh, force that pushes us towards these foods, whether it's like someone bringing stuff into the office or every social event having food at it. There's just really no way you can you can get around it. You're going to be exposed to stuff. So... Then there's more troubling research <laughs> that says if you restrict food intake of something, again, if cookies is your thing, then it turns out not only are those cravings not going to go away, but when you have those cookies again, that experience will be heightened. In a sense, they'll be like better than you remember. They're so much better. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It'll, be, it'll be better than it was <laughs> previously because you've restricted it for so long. You think, you might think, that it would be the opposite. Your body would get used to not having it. No, it's not. That's not how it works, unfortunately. Um, so I think we just we need to develop a new flexible relationship with desired foods. I'm not sure we figured it out yet, but we have people bring in their foods and practice looking at, touching, and yes, even tasting the food, without going too far in a safer environment, with small portions, and then we always throw some of it away mm-hmm. purposefully. Mm-hmm. Um, we have them practice eating something healthy when desired foods are around. And then we have them do these things at home because we think this is a skill you need to have if you're going to, you know, do healthy stuff long term. Can it backfire? Absolutely. (laughs) But I think if you never try to deal with the issue, restriction tends to work for very few people in the long run. It Mm -hmm. just doesn't really work. It's a small percentage of people it does work for. um, And those people already a traditional approach works for them. They don't need anything new. So, um, but eventually the desired food gets eaten again. And when it does, if you haven't practiced, you have nothing to deal with it. Right. So one of the things that you do in the, in the book is you actually create a hierarchy of crave foods and then have people go through that. Have you done that system? I've done that with some clients. And it, what's been interesting to see is that for some clients, it works really well. For other clients, it actually has worked well for them to just say, I no longer eat this food. Mm-hmm. It's it's mm-hmm. too challenging for me to, especially around fast food for some people, that's just really challenging. Uh, I can like I can think of one client in particular that he changed his breakfast from a fast food breakfast to a Starbucks breakfast because it was too mm-hmm. hard to go into the fast food breakfast and order off that menu. Yep. So yeah, I'm, I'm just curious about, have you seen it different for different people look more individualized. Yes, I've had the same experience that you've had. And that's why I cautioned at the beginning that I don't think we've totally figured this out because, yeah. you know, I do think that for for some people, um, the idea of putting a, a certain foods in the not ever category does work. And it particularly works with stuff that can be avoided a little bit easier. Um, 
like you said with fast food, so so nobody typically is going to bring Whoppers to the office and just leave the Whoppers out, right? Um, so the, there are some things that you can just replace and eliminate. Um, whereas something like, like if someone said to me, I'm never going to eat pizza again, I'm like, well, you're going to be around pizza a lot, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that might work, but it might also not work that much. So I do think you're right. I do think from a clinical perspective, it's, it's, I think key to work with a specific client on what works best for them. And a combination of both is probably the right move. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately I don't have any like specific guidelines that I can point to yet that like the person sitting in front of you, what's going to work for best for them. I yeah. think it's something you guys right now where the science is, you have to kind of feel out. Um, but I think generally speaking, I would work with something with each client on an exposure base because it's more the skill of experiencing desire and then not losing total control with the behavior mm -hmm. um, that I think people need to experience. And then also practicing kind of re bringing their values into the equation when they have these powerful cravings because it's hard to, you know, it's easier to do if, say, you have a reminder every morning to, like, write about your values. But when you show up to the party and, oh, they have this spread of things, it's harder to then stop at that party and say, wait, why am I doing this? Why is this important to me? So if you if you have an experience of practicing that, it's going to be very hard to be mindful of your values when healthy choices need to be made sometimes. And value spotting can be strengthened. It is a skill that if you practice it over time, you will start to notice, oh, I'm, I'm thinking about my values more when I'm yes. making decisions. I've noticed that for myself and as well as for my clients, that it, it, it is a skill that can be strengthened with practice, like you're saying. And what Absolutely. you're alluding to is is around all of this is, is sort of a willingness component, that there's going to be some discomfort that shows up. <laughs> along the way as you're making behavior health health changes. Can you talk a little bit about willingness and and how you define that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I you know, willingness for me is the how, values is the why. You know, so you have the you know, why do I want to do this? Why is this meaningful for you? And then it's like, well, how do I do this? And um, you know, that's where I think willingness comes in um it's about allowing yourself to just feel whatever you feel including the negative having whatever thoughts you have including the self-sabotage ones uh and and still choosing behavior that's consistent with your values so uh, a big topic for us in our work in this area is discussing foregoing pleasure that mm -hmm. seems to be one of the biggest issues for folks who are in a weight control program. And it's a really big ask for behavior change. TV time on the couch and comfort foods, convenient fast foods, these are things that are just, I mean, frankly, they just help our day out. <laughs> they just make things a lot easier. So uh, having to forgo these things to make healthy changes, that's really hard to do. Um, so it really is, you have to have both pieces in order to do it. You need it needs to matter to people deeply to make these choices and continue to make them in the long term health wise. That's where the values part comes in. And then there has to be a significant amount of practice being, you know, ha being in the state of desire or, you know, desiring either um, pleasure from food or pleasure from sedentary activities and then making alternative choices that are harder to make. Um, so, that's kind of how we think of willingness. Um, from a traditional, like, act mental health perspective, it's often about um, allowing negative emotions like um, anxiety, you know, fear, sadness to be present, and then still doing things that matter to you, like, you know, um, spending time with your partner or, um, you know, going to work or whatever it is. My experience in weight is that that sort of message has not resonated as well with folks. Hmm. What's resonating is this idea of foregoing comfort and pleasure. Like that that seems to be the key issue for more of the people that end up um, looking for help in this area, at least from my studies mm -hmm. and my clinical work. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that really resonates with people. So it's a little bit of a um, slight difference from more traditional act work 
Well, there's a willingness to experience some loss there. Like there's, right. there's loss sure. around, oh, I really enjoy that feeling of, of comfort food or being cozy on the couch and eating and kind of numbing out. There's a, there's a loss there. And then yeah. I also think also with willingness is the discomfort associated with physical activity. So there's yeah. also mm-hmm. some willingness there of I'm willing to willingness around waking up an hour earlier to exercise or right. experiencing the, the discomfort of exercise and how that feels or movement, how that may feel. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's uncomfortable. Although exercise is an interesting case. I'm glad yeah. you brought that up um, because they're, tend to be a lot of benefits to exercising. The problem with exercise is getting started. Yeah. If you get people started, it has some very just naturally reinforcing properties that come along with um, you know, finishing an exercise and also the um, positive health effects over time. You can actually experience them with the energy. You'll, t- you'll start sleeping better after a couple of weeks. Your energy level will be higher, things like that. Um, but it's getting started. Mm-hmm. It's getting started. And that's where the willingness piece comes in, like you mentioned. Um, because you might have to get up early and you feel not so good when you get up early. And your mind has a lot of things to say about it too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It'll give you all kinds of reasons why you can't do this yes. uh, for one reason or another. Or, you know, people who go end of the day, it's the same thing. I'm too tired. I have too much to do. Uh, my kids need X, Y, Z. I have to get, you know, A, B, and C ready for tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. Yes. So it, it's, it's really the key is getting people started and that's where the willingness comes in. Yes. And can you talk a little bit more about some of, you kind of mentioned some of the experiential exercises uh, in, in the book, and it is a very experiential book. You could, you could read through it probably, I don't know, in a few days, but if you actually worked through it, it should take a while to get through it because you're doing, you're writing things and doing visualizations. Which one of, the, one of them do you like the most or do you find most helpful in your work? Is there anything that stands out for you? Hmm. You know, what's surprising to me is that um, when I work with people, it's always something, it's different things that, you know, it, it's really interesting to do a treatment like this because, you know, things that I maybe think are the quote unquote best, most interesting things, you know, do, doesn't always play out that way with clients. But I, I do think there are two things that if you never did act and you never read a book uh, or read this book that I think everyone could find helpful. I think one is, I think we have this in the book, uh, body appreciation, body Mm -hmm. compassion exercise, um, where, you know, you could do this very easily just by finding a quiet place, closing your eyes and just turning your attention to your body, different parts of your body and just notice and appreciate what it does for you, what it's done for your whole life. So for example, we talk about how your heart just never stops pumping blood, um, to keep you alive, works tirelessly, never so much as a thank you. You don't really think about it very much unless something's going wrong, of course. Um, You know, you just sit with that, notice it, marvel at it. Your stomach's the same way. It digests everything you send down there one way or another. It stores what it can. It gets rid of what it can. And we put a a lot of not good stuff down there and it doesn't, keeps doing what it's doing. So you can kind of work your way through your whole body and just notice each thing, how amazing it is. And, um, you know, how thankful you are that it keeps working for you. And and um, because I think having a compassion for yourself and um, and your body is can be a really empowering experience. Uh, we often see our bodies as the enemy. Um, and I think that that's not the most powerful perspective to come if you want to make behavioral change. Um, you know, the other thing is this isn't really act specific, but. You know, I would just say to journal what's important about you. If you just did that every day for two to three to five minutes, you would, absent anything else, you would change your behavior in mm-hmm. some ways. And and we know that there's research on it that if you just write about what's important to you, that people ha- has a positive impact. And um, that's something everyone can do. But you can even make it more specific. And as you write about those things, you could say, well, how would being more healthy how could I do more of that? Or how could I be more like that in this area? And uh, kind of link it up to your health efforts as well. Um, I think those are both pretty universal. If you, if you want to know, a, a um, yeah, well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> those two are wonderful. Yeah. 
And I guess I also have a question for you personally, which is how do you practice this in your own life? And you said you this is a struggle that you've had for a long time. And what do you do to take care of your own health and, and your own values around your, you know, health re- health related activities? Yeah. Um, there are times I, I do better and times I'm not <laughs> do as well. Mm-hmm. I have a newborn now. Oh, man, so you're not sleeping. I have a four month old to go oh. with the uh, the four year old. Um, and my my four year old is the sweetest kid on the planet, but he's he's also special needs. And um, so it's it's been a challenge to have a, a newborn on top of that. And I've certainly been healthier than I've been these days. But as I'm pulling myself out of my own unhealthy behavioral patterns, as it is the new year is the time for those things. Uh, I've, to me, the most, the thing that's resonated most with me about ACT forever has been um, two things, really. You know, one is the values piece. I find it very powerful. So I, I try my best to um, reorient myself to my values as a dad. Um, like I said, I have a, a, a severe special needs kid and a newborn, and I'm already 40. And so I really want to have the energy and love to give to the newborn. And, you know, I will probably need to be unusually capable in terms of hands-on parenting as I grow older uh, from my oldest son. And my desire to provide for them is, is what motivates me to get my butt moving and <laughs> get healthy food on the table. So it's really kind of reminding me, myself of that uh, over and over again. Um, so that sets in <laughs> and, um, so it comes back to values for me, but, you know, the other piece that always resonated with me was, um, just being able to step back from your thoughts, um, and take, take a breather because, um, you know, a lot of times I just will get in a thought cycle about how, you know, things are, things are too hard. That's a, that's a, that's one, you know, I'll just push the healthy behavior down the road because right now it's just things are too hard, we're too busy, whatever. And um, um, so, you know, I, I try to practice um, just a few minutes a day of just sitting there and noticing my stream of thoughts, which is a, is a kind of a classic act exercise. We have some forms of it in the book as well. And it helps ground me into you know, not getting lost in that stream of um, negative thinking or it's not even negative thinking. It's more of like, I don't know how to describe it. Like I always feel like there's not enough time and my mind will just kind of give me a constant stream of that, that there's other things I need to be doing. Mm -hmm. But really, if I don't take care of myself, it's not, those other things aren't going to be worth very much. So, (laughs) so I have to, you know, slow things down, you know, um, step back from the thinking um, try to reorient to my values, and um, and I found that to be helping recently as I'm pulling myself out for the ten millionth time in my life from <laughs> unhealthy patterns. <laughs> yes, and I appreciate that so much because I think that the the thing that drew me most to act early on was hearing someone that I thought was an expert, like Steve Hayes, talk about his own struggle. And for you to talk about your own struggle as a like leading expert in <laughs> obesity research, saying yes, it's I'm you know I move out of alignment and then I move back in, and that's that is part of the process. We're just moving in and out of alignment over and over and over again. But noticing it and knowing what your alignment is 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 so important, and and that's really a gift um, that researchers like you have helped us in terms of understanding ACT. And thank you for that. So is there any other closing things that you want to say about maybe your research, uh, what the directions it's going in um, that could be exciting for us to think about for the future? Yeah, I, the things that I'm excited about that I'm hoping to, to do some studies on is, I, you know, I'd really, we talked about earlier, but I'd, I'd really like to see us better develop our methods for this ex- food exposure thing mm-hmm. and try to figure out what works best for, for what kinds of people. And and what kind of role that has in the treatment overall? Because I feel like there's so few people doing it. Because the idea that you'd have a a weight intervention and 
you know, give people food is just, <laughs> <laughs> you just think it's crazy. So paradoxical, yeah. Yeah, it's people like, right. so um, I'm excited to see where that's going. I, I have um, things I'd like to try out to see just what works for different people. Um, I'd also like to see some more technology stuff because I think um, values in particular lends itself very well to smartphone based inter, you know interventions and helping remi- you know re- reminding yourself of your values is hard we might as well use the tools around us to mm-hmm. <laughs> to kind of help us with that task and i think people have done that in other areas with acts but i haven't seen it done in weight yet so i'd love to see people you know package and use tiny values interventions that you can deliver to people throughout the day or when it's needed um you know to help people you know, continue to access that source of motivation uh, through what what deeply matters to them. And then I've always had a soft spot for issues related to stigma and just the mental health toll that that takes on folks of living in a society that, you know, dramatically stigmatizes something that they can't hide, you know, their body shape, and what the kind of pervasive and debilitative effects of that have been. so I'm, I'm hoping to um, develop a more compassion-focused, emotion-focused form of this kind of intervention that is specifically for folks who struggle, you know, deeply with issues of stigma. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of actually where I started with my dissertation, and then I kind of veered off back into, like, more mainstream uh, weight control, but I'm hoping to go veer back to... Um, making stigma more of a focus for people. Thank you. Well, we look forward to hearing about how those res- that, that research does. And I, um, I guess I want to thank you again for taking time out during this busy time. And now that I know you have a four and a half month, month old, I appreciate you even more <laughs> for taking time out to do this um, interview with us. And if people want to contact you, I'll put a link to your website, to the Brown sure. website on um, Psychologists Off the Clock. And anything else that you, any other way for people to contact you? Is that the best? Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely the best way to reach me. Okay. Um, Great. um, So yeah. Thank you. And I'll also, again, put a link to your books if people want to check those out. I really highly recommend them and you can get them on audible if you like to listen to them while you walk, like, like I do. So that would be a a good resource too. Thank you so much and uh, have a wonderful rest of your new year. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was wonderful. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and iTunes. You can also find us at www.offtheclockpsych.com. That's off the clock, P-S-Y-C-H.com. Music by John Goo and Susie Stevens.